Lewinsky, E F L O N. Also, be following on this channel at Hot Topic Celeb TV. He is, ladies and gentlemen, the Italian Stallion, all the way from New Jersey. He is the Robert De Niro of prime time. He is the man with the largest arms in TV. You guys know him, ladies and gentlemen, as Jim Mumford on SWAT. You know him on as well right now from shows like This Is Us, Station 19. Tonight joining us, my friend, all the way from Los Angeles, Peter Onorati. Thank you, my friend. Welcome right. to the building. All right. Am I in? <laughs> you are in. All right. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, man? How are you doing? I'm uh, I'm all right. It's you know I'm a little warm, but I'm all right. How have you been uh, holding up since, since this you know this this crazy two years of of COVID nineteen and and pandemic? I mean, how how has that been for you? Um, it, you know what? It's been not so bad. Um, one of my sons uh, got COVID by accident, but he, he didn't get the, he didn't get it that bad. Uh, the worst thing about the whole thing for me. Uh, aside from, you know, what it did to other people was that the gyms were closed and I had to work out in my cell. <laughs> so. well, how, how, I mean, did you did you find the, you know, the, the I mean, I know for us in the business, I mean, it was tough for a lot of us in the film and television world. Did you enjoy, I guess you would say, the time off or did you stay actively busy throughout the entire pandemic? I actually, when, when, Production started up again. I stayed pretty busy. Uh, I mean, I did Station 19. I did This Is Us. Uh, I did another big episode of SWAT. Um, uh, so I, I was, and I did, uh, I did a couple episodes of a sitcom called Mom. Um, and, you know, so I actually was, business-wise, was quite busy. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take the, the callers and the viewers and the people who are just joining on tonight who are not familiar with you and familiar with your career. So we're going to start back from the very beginning. For you, how did you, I mean, I know things that I've heard, so I want, I want to confirm it from the actual source. Right. And everyone has their story of, of course, of how they made their journey into Hollywood, into this crazy business. But yours has to be one of the craziest I've heard. Did you start off selling calculators? I did. My first job out of college, uh, uh, my bachelor's degree was selling uh, calculators for Monroe Calculator Company. Okay. Uh, yeah. And then I went to a, a, a retail establishment, a, 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 a discount retail establishment called Two Guys from Harrison okay. uh, in New Jersey. And if you want to picture what Two Guys is really like, think two steps below Walmart and you'd probably get... Uh, what the place was like. Um, and then, uh, you know, I had a, a, a different road. I, I went into retailing. I sold menswear for a few years. I was a manager of a menswear store. I managed the disco after, after I got, uh, you know, back, done with my workouts at night. I'd go uh, at 9 o'clock, and I managed the disco. And, uh, okay. and then I ended up getting my MBA uh, uh, while I was working at Ford Motor Company in the export division. Um, and uh, as soon as I got my MBA, which they paid for the last two thirds of, okay, uh, they laid me off because it was the auto business and it was in bad shape in 1980. And uh, so I'd done my master's thesis on a magazine that my girlfriend at the time was working for. It was called Working Mother Magazine. Right. I think it's still around. And so I presented my thesis to them and they hired me and created the director of marketing and research job for me. Uh, so I was there for four years. Um, during that time, I was doing improvisational comedy as a hobby in all the hole in the walls in New York City. Uh, I then had some of my research um, published in advertising age, started getting calls from, uh, uh, you know, big package goods firm wanting to steal me away. And I went in to talk to my boss. Now I worked with 15 women at the time. Two were my superiors and uh, 13 were on the same level as me. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, I mean, I got more penis birthday cakes than you could have <laughs> okay? and, and, and so um, 
I said to my boss, and we were friends. We had a share in a house in the Hamptons and all that yuppie crap. And uh, I said, these people are trying to steal me away. Maybe there's some way we can, you know, a little bonus next year. And she got angry with me and started to make my life miserable. So um, I lost my first girlfriend. And I was going out with a, a, a starving actress who is now my wife. And mm -hmm. she said to me, I think you could, I think you could be an actor. And I said, Oh really? So I can starve and have four jobs like you. <laughs> so once I took the ice pack off my eye, uh, I walked into my boss's office at McCall's and I said, uh, you know, you can't fire me. My work is too good. So I'll tell you what, I never collected unemployment. You make it so I can collect unemployment and I'll leave. She cut the deal and I left the next Monday. Um, I left them with a 200 page research document that all, all it needed was to be updated. They didn't have to do any work. And I enrolled in a crash course in commercials. And within a week and a half, I was on hold for a national beer commercial. But here's the thing mm -hmm. at that time, this is like 1985, 86 at that time, the big stereotypes that they were casting for in commercials were Bruce Willis, Bruce Springsteen, Tony Danza, and Billy Joel. Okay? And you fit the mold of all that. <laughs> I got, as they say, I got a piece of each, you know? Uh-huh. So that was the start of my career. And then within two years, um, I, I, I started on Kate and Alley, the last season of Kate and Alley, and I got my first big movie, which was Goodfellas. So for you, like, obviously, you know, like, going from the retail world, and I mean, and, I, and I've done that same journey myself. Yeah. How was it for you, like, you know, the very, your first experience on a film and television set? What was that? Was that nerve wracking for you? Was that, you know, something that, you know, you just yeah. easily walked into and said, hey, I'm, I could do this? No, yeah, actually, my first job on a set was a commercial. It was a United Airlines commercial. It was a big national commercial. And uh, I was, of course, intimidated. But I had like three or four years of improvisation uh, background, you know, that I had been training with, uh, with my then girlfriend, Comedy. now wife, and, and a group of people. And so, I, you know what? I felt that for 30 seconds, I could keep up with anybody, <laughs> you know? And uh, so, you know, and, and, and those kind of nerves never stop. I mean, even when you got a job and you step on a stage, there's always you know, a nervousness and a newness. And, but that's, that's part of the creative juices, man. That's what makes you, you know, on your toes and, and, you know, and, and wanting, wanting to put your best foot forward it makes you search your entire soul and body to deliver, you know, uh, to deliver the product when, when you get your chance, you know? So when you obviously, I mean, when you obviously, when, when people decide to make that jump, of course, into the entertainment world, we're always met with, you know, that's not realistic. Get a real job. It's never going to happen for you. Did you well, ever have that like voice in your ear from someone who no. was, whether it be family or even any, no. anybody that was in your circle was like, no, you can't do it. Or did you, do they always say that, you know what, your personality, you should have been an actor. Well, nobody ever said that, I, you know, that I should have been an actor, but, um, I never, there was never any negativity around me. And one of the reasons was because I took that sword out of the hands of my family and friends who knew me before. Because when I got mm -hmm. into acting, and I was already in the business world for 12 years, I already owned my house. I had money, unlike most people who get into acting. And so I took $10,000 out and I put it in a separate bank account. And I said, if this runs out and I'm not an actor, then I'm not an actor because I like what I was doing. I was an ad man, you know, mm -hmm. I could have gone back to that in a heartbeat. So in a lot of ways, um, I was insulated much more than anyone else who ever tries to get into the business. I love that. But, I love that. But yeah. And, and here's the thing. My wife, she grew up in Santa Barbara. She studied acting in Santa Barbara with a great uh, leading man uh, of the late fifties. He was in, uh, I don't know if it was bus stop with Marilyn Monroe. He played St. Francis of Assisi. His name was Bradford Dillman, a very famous actor of his time. Okay. And she studied with Brad. And Brad said to all the actors in his class, if you want to be an actor, find something else that you love to do as much and can make a living at. And then you have a better chance of being an actor. 
which yeah. makes sense because every audition that you go into, you're not metaphorically on your knees begging for a job to make rent or, or, or to mm -hmm. buy food or anything else. And there's nothing so, worse than that, bro. There's nothing no, worse than that one. I can understand that. I mean, you know, I really can. And, and here's another thing that happened to me. Because of my expertise in the business world, when I left McCall's, a woman that I knew who was an actress said, hey, my boss wants to meet you. This guy mm -hmm. had a marketing firm in New York City. I went and interviewed with him. And he said, you have expertise that I need. He said, I'll tell you what. Now, we're talking, this is 1986. He said, if you promise me that you'll come into my office and meet with product managers from big companies like Procter & Gamble and Bronfman and meet with them for three hours and talk to them about new market niches they want to go into. And then you promise me another three hours back home and you come in the next day with 10 to 20 new product ideas. I will pay you $500 a day in 1986. Wow. So as an actor. And that's like $5,000 back then. <laughs> yeah. And as an actor in New York, I only had to work four days a month and I would pay for everything, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so again, but, but none of that could have happened if I didn't already have 12 years and an MBA and did what I did before, you know? The other blessing of having lived that life first was that instead of, and I'm not casting aspersions on anybody, but instead of being an actor who had to support his career first by, by waiting tables and stuff like that, I... Hold on a second, like man. You cut out your, your reception. Oh, okay. Your reception, uh, your is, reception is going out. Yeah, a little bit better. You might want to, yeah. Might want to, yeah. Just work either or go to a, a better area where you got better Wi-Fi. Uh, let me see. All right. Let me see. Okay. It should be should be fine. Uh, how about this? Okay, you're getting. Yeah, you're sounding better now. Okay. So, um, uh, I I think where I was 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 that um, um, I had already played. I mean, I already already lived as. Uh, the person I was about to play for the next 20 years of my career. I was a okay. professional. I, I, you know, I played lawyers, I played businessmen, and I had already done that, you know. Uh, th that's who I was, you know. I know you had, you started off as well, like you had a, you had a, a quite a budding sports career in the NCAA. Play, was it playing football? Yeah, it was, it was a small college, uh, a place called Lycoming College. Uh, okay. It was a small Division three school, so um, you know, it wasn't as prolific as it sounds, but I did end up getting a, 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 tr a tryout in the World Football League, and I uh, made it to the last cut and then found my uh, found something else to do with my life. That's when I went back for my MBA. Was sports your first passion, though, like before? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I wanted to be a professional football player. Uh, that was that, That's what I wanted to do. That's one of the reasons I went to a Division three school instead of going to Division one because I knew I'd play and I'd get some – press and you know i made i they had a weekly all-conference team and i made it a couple times and and you know held a few held a few records um you know uh hold on let me get this yep yep no problem all right there we go sorry about that that's what happens when you got to move around right, no problem um <laughs> so yeah no the football i mean i loved i i i i loved the game man and uh and there actually was a guy who beat me out for all conference my first two years. And then he graduated um, and he became a, a pretty well-known player in the NFL, even for a short time. His name was Billy White Shoes Johnson. Okay. I don't know. He played for the Houston Oilers and he returned punts and stuff, but he had this flamboyant touchdown dance that made him really famous, you know? So the small division three ball was, was good for me. Um, I, you know, had I gone to a Division One, I, I might not have played. I don't know. Do you feel that, like, by, you know, obviously when it comes to – because I'm an, an ex-athlete myself, and, like, I, I feel that, like, the gridiron of sports totally mentally prepares you for this entertainment industry of the mental – because I've always said, you know, that the, the, the business, yeah. in order to survive in it, it really starts with – mental and internal toughness Absolutely. because it's a business where you know just like in sports you know everybody who steps on a field whether you're playing baseball or football they all have desires to of course play professional 
and play right. in the big leagues. Sure. But then, you know, your, 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 your dream sometimes in that industry doesn't work out whether it be with, you know, take one day, it could take an, inju an injury, or as you said, you can just get cut, yeah. you know, and, and, and have to sort of figure out, you know, where, what I'm doing next. Did you find for yourself, obviously, you know, when you step into the film industry with that background from sports and as well, of course, the business Ackerman, because I've always said, too, especially yeah. when, you know, even when you're in the acting business, there's many people that are in our industry right. that just want to be actors. But they don't want they don't understand right. that in order for you to be an actor and to be a working actor. You have to understand the yeah. business side of it. So did you feel that that helped sure. you with all the, the qualities that you had from business and sports into helping you advance into well, your career early? Definitely the business side helped me because you know, my MBA was in marketing and market research. So I never, in, in this business, I never went after something that I knew or expected to get something that I knew was uh -huh. out of out of my market niche, you know. Uh, is somebody yelling? Did I say something? Did I do something? No, no. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Continue. So, 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 yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, and like, as evidenced by the fact that I, I got into commercials first because I I had no acting training. All I did was okay. play around with improvisation. So I knew that I could sustain a character for thirty seconds or a minute, but okay. Um, but as far as acting training, I, I had none, you know, and I still really have no formal training. I think I studied for almost a year with a, a couple of friends back in New York, actor studio. And uh, and I started working so much that I, I, I never studied again, you know, uh, as far as the sports end of it. Well, sure. I mean, think of it. If you're out in a field, you're on a football field every play is either a success or a failure and you have to deal with that and move on to the next play, you know? And so mm -hmm. in this business, you, you know, you have to understand that, you know, that it, there are successes and failures and you have to move on. So sports in that way did indeed, you know, train me to keep going on <clears throat> and not let one thing stop me. You know, the other thing well, so they, that I learned. Yeah, go ahead. Good. I said, the other well, continue, thing that I learned from from sports, the other thing that I learned early on, mm -hmm. and unfortunately is probably was, uh, some people say, well, you know, that's not quite the way to learn it, but you know what? I learned it and it was a gift to me. I had some psychos for coaches in high school. They did things to us <laughs> that they would be in, in jail now for, okay? I mean, I stuff that, I actually saw one of my ex-football coaches at a reunion a couple of years ago and he looked at me, he goes, Man, I'd be in prison if I was coaching now. And I go, yeah, you absolutely would. Mm -hmm. But these guys, these psychos, who all came out of the military when I was a kid and came, became teachers, mm -hmm. they used their military training to train us. And they taught us discipline. And they taught us one thing that, unfortunately, my kids didn't get um, because I guess people considered it politically incorrect. But they taught me that I could go beyond my perceived limits, you know? Mm -hmm. and kids today even my kids never got pushed to that point so that's another thing that prepared me for this business you know and, and, and to understand that you know i could take whatever you got and i could take more you know and, well i think that's and, the and thing again, with i think that i think that's the thing with this with this er, with this era compared to that era and which i hate this era is because when you know when you had to start back then, exactly what you said, you yeah. you were pushed to a limit where you had to put in the work, and if you want, and if you put in the work, you got results. Nothing was handed to you. Like there was right. no opportunities that were handed to you if you wanted to, whether whether it be an actor or or a model or a, a, yeah. a sports person, you had to to be two things. You had to put in the work. Yeah. You also have to understand you have to be able to surround yourself with people that are greater than you in order right. for you to be able, number one, to absorb. And I mean, I think the problem with now is, is that like you could give people information. You could tell them, OK, you know what? Like this is my this is what the blueprint is. This is what's, you know, yeah. it's not necessarily going to work for you, but I'm going to give you the steps to be right. able, number one, to, you know, to 
maybe flourish in this career or flourish in this business. And back then, when someone gave you information, people listened. Like they really listened and they, they applied it. Now yeah. you give yeah. someone information in this business and because of social media, when it comes yeah. to the likes and the followers and et cetera, yeah. et cetera, you get people, number one, that want shit. It's, and, and you know this as well as I do, and you're obviously, you know, a gym guy. Yeah. It's like someone could look at your physique and say, you know what, Peter, I want, I want to be jacked like you. And, mm -hmm. and, 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 and back then, what it took to be able not only right. to get the body, but to maintain yeah. it, because that's the key. It's not about yeah. even putting it on. It's about, okay, once I get to this physique, how yeah. do I maintain this lifestyle? And it's the same thing with yeah. the business where it's like you yeah. can tell somebody, hey, you know what, this is what you need to do to become an actor or whatever, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But because they're seeing the Kardashians, the quick, easy money, the quick likes, the quick this, yeah. nobody wants to put in that work anymore. So for you, like... How do you, a person who's been in the game for so long and seen the industry on all levels change from when you started yeah. to now, what is your view on the business now? I don't want to have a negative view on the business, but because, uh, because as, as an improviser at heart, I should be able to deal with change. But what you're talking about is not just in the business, it's the world we live in now, the lack of responsibility one-to-one -one in life that has been created by the distance of the internet. And yet, mm -hmm. and yet, and yet the intimate relationships that we, we manufacture over the internet and we, without responsibility. In other words, <clears throat> I, I say something to you, here that mm -hmm. I would never say to your face <laughs> because you know what and and that's the thing nobody's responsible you know you wouldn't say some of this stuff to somebody if you were having a conversation with them they jack your wig you mm -hmm. know and, and 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 so in, in terms of the business there's there's one thing I'm struggling with right now I really <clears throat> don't like and uh, my manager just called me before you did Mm -hmm. uh, to say, oh, I want you. To, I want you to tap into this. Look at this one thing, um, this self taping business. Uh, oh God! For, for auditions, <laughs> right? Uh -huh. uh, I mean, I got my wife reading me lines, which is fine. But I'm down in my cellar. I got a light. I got. I got to make sure the mm -hmm. dogs aren't barking. And if the dogs are inside, I got to make sure they're not scratching, mm -hmm. so it doesn't sound like somebody's stomping on the ceiling. And I and it's <laughs> we're, we're now we're producing. <laughs> We're the grips, we're the producers, uh -huh. we're the directors. And, uh -huh. and I, I don't say that that's a bad thing. It is for me because, because, when, because somehow over the years, I, I cultivated a, a, a technique for myself for auditions that sunk me in. And I'm not saying that I walked around in the character, but sunk me into the audition and the material and stuff like that. And I don't want to have to lose focus on that material and on that character and on that situation. All this work that I've done for two days up to that, to screw around with the friggin' lights or to tell my wife, no, you don't read that part. Or to tell my son to get the friggin' dogs out of mm -hmm. the house. That's just horrible. And also, there's a modicum of theatrical presentation when you're in the room with a casting person and a director mm -hmm. they can feel your energy you know and for some and you people, can feel it within like, yourself too you can feel yeah, it within yourself yeah. when you know that you know when you've had a good audition or when you've like yeah. i fucking bombed that like i was terrible you know what and that's the thing you know if there's a give and take there it's it's like it's like i used to do a little bit of stand-up too with a friend of mine and uh, being in a, in, in a stand-up situation, man, I, the audience is right there. And there is, it, it sounds trite and, 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 and stereotypical, but the truth of the matter is there is an energy shared when you're in the room with an audience like that. You play off them, mm -hmm. they play off you, and you know how it's going to be when you walk out on that stage. You know if they're with you or if you're going to have to work your ass off to get them with you, you know? And it's the same thing in the casting room. When somebody's reading to you, 
you know whether they're interested in you being there or they're just bringing you in because they already got the person they want, but they want that person to, to, to shake in their boots because they're bringing you in for the same part. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. that, that sometimes that happens. Well, I mean, I think that's I, the I thing. When it, I mean, when it, when, it come, when, you, when you look at it, you got to look at it, I guess you would say, like theater. Yeah. Your phone cut out. Yeah. What would you say? What was the last part? Well, that's, that's when you look at it like theater, th yeah. theater, you know, and, and I think, you know, I, I mean, a lot of I'm, I've had this conversation with with different actors over the, the last several weeks in regards to their adjustment from, as you said, from the in the room to the self tapes to, you know, the online Zoom editions and shit that we're doing now. Right. And yeah. for 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 half of them, they say, you know what, like they like it only because you have time when you get submitted something yeah. to properly perfect it, like get it done right. And then send it in a tape and go, okay, I was good with that tape. But then there's yeah. the other half exactly like you that want that sort of instant feel because, and I think it really, energy. it really boils down to it's half energy, but I think it boils down to an actor's approach to the work because you know as well as i do being from new york which is a which is a yeah. well-known obviously theater city of yeah. improv and broadway and then you've got the la side where it's all you know for show play you know you've, you've got your typical yeah. stereotypes of, of of castings where you've got you know your preppies for like 90210 you've got you know your tough guys for you know yeah. for the mobster yeah. movies you've got you know the the jocks for you know the the high school football movies yeah and and and, and the approach to the work and to the additions are so much different when you come from a theater based background because again as you said you're from doing stand up and improv you're used to that sync almost like a like a parachute when you jump out yeah. of a plane it's like yeah i got this is just me i just, it's just me yes. and i'm either i'm either i'm either gonna you know fall into the water and swim away or i'm gonna crash into a hard rock and and it's and it's gonna be dead and then you've got you know the yeah. acting aspect of like you know where you look at um the actors for example and, I, and i'm sure you've you've worked with actors where you know where you work with an actor that comes from that theater background right compared to when you work with an actor that comes from just from let me read my lines and yeah memorize my lines and and, yeah. and you're giving them something but you're just not getting anything back from right. them in that situation so yeah. for you like obviously you know making that having to make that adjustment do you yeah. feel well, that I like now you're cutting out there. Yeah, I mean, I mean, okay. How about now? Go, go okay. ahead. Okay. So, um, I always felt, especially when I had my own series, that when somebody came on the set, um, whether they were a historic actor or somebody new, I always felt when their half of the mm -hmm. room was full and I only had to fill my half, you know? And that, I carry that sort of energy output with me all the time. And that's the same thing that happens in the casting office. You know, I'm filling my half of the room and they do what they got to do. And, and mm -hmm. I, 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 I just, I, I just, I just feel like there is like, you know, I'll give you a perfect example. You said, you said you're talking about New York actors. When I first came out here and I would audition even for a commercial, the casting agent would shut the camera you off cut and out. go, you oh, cut thank out. God, a New York actor. Oh, the casting agent would, would, um, would shut the camera off and would go, thank God, a New York actor. You know? Uh, did you hear that? Yeah. Okay. And, and, and then they, you know, and, and I didn't know what that meant. And now I realize it meant what you said. New York actors are, are, are much more involved in the process um, well, that's me. I'm a New York guy. I'm a New York guy. <laughs> yeah. I'm originally and, a New York guy. So. And people out here are much more involved in the end product, the production. Come and say your line, get your check, and go home. Because mm -hmm. the, the commerce is out here. In New York, it's not as commercial. You know, it's, it's more about the art. But the commerce, the end of it. And by the way, 
there's nothing wrong with commerce because it's commerce that allows us to execute our art, you know, mm -hmm. but there is, a, there is a difference on both coasts. Uh, and I think that difference still probably exists. You know, uh, there, I used to go, pe agents used to come and see me when I didn't have an agent uh, in some of the worst hole in the walls in New York. <laughs> I was doing something. Nobody mm -hmm. out here since I've been out here and I, I, I've always had agents and big agencies out here. So I didn't need that, but I have friends coming up, you know, and, mm -hmm nobody goes to see anything out here, you know, at some of these smaller theaters, unless they're a really good agent or somebody who's really into the business and looking for new talent. And there's not much of that around. And, mm -hmm. and you know, and, and today agency is, is more like order taking. Nobody goes out there and says, Hey, I got a guy who's a low rent De Niro. Why don't you put him into this project? You know, uh, you know, and, and they don't sell you anymore. You know, uh, well, that's I the thing good, it's about, about I, what you said about selling is that do you they do you find now that especially as I said from the self tapes and everything else the business changing where where you are a guy who's got you know one hundred and thirty five plus titles work with some of the biggest shows been on you know some of the best products that have been on television where someone could like basically who doesn't know you. Where they go, okay, you know, this guy's got all these titles, but they go with these agencies now. It's not even about talent. Yeah. It's not even about resume. It's about likes and followers. It's about social media stuff. Well, yes. I mean, do you find that and, that and has right. been a problem? Um, not really, because I'm lucky that I'm at this point in my career where most networks know me um new casting agents are like mm -hmm. you know maybe who's this guy you know but um and i do have i'm at a small agency now and, and i have to say for the first time i mean i was with all the big agencies william morris icm all the, and this particular agency i feel more like they are selling me than than i've had in years and years and years you know and um and so, so, you know, that's a good feeling to have. But, but there are some times, for instance, where, and this is also a dangerous thing. There's two things I wanted to say. This is a dangerous thing. Sometimes an agent okay. will call me, not, not, not this agency, um, but uh, my manager, who's, was, okay. who was actually my first agent, is, is, she's now my manager. We've been together for over 30 years. An, an agent may call you, and this is for other actors, they may call you and say, you know what, this is a small project. You're not auditioning it for this, you know. And uh, as an actor, um, I don't care what your career is. That's your job, you know. That's your job. Part of the job is to audition for it, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't like the character or it is too small of a bite and you'd like to wait on that show for a bigger bite or a bigger character, you could say that. But you shouldn't fall into that trap like auditions are below me. You know what I mean? Well, uh, that came that's my that's a very very good point because it brings to my next point of what, where I ask people all the time. You know, when you started in the business, and, I, and even with people that I train at classes, and I and I, I go to my students, I'm like, "What do you want to be? Do you want to be a working actor, or do you want to be a celebrity?" Right. Because there's many people that only they, they, they want it. They they want the celebrity aspect. Yeah. Where you get you know the one job that you book, and it's huge. And then yeah. you never book anything again. <laughs> yeah. Or you get the, the, the actor that says, okay, you know what? I'm going to take the under the radar. It may not be, you know, the best. Because you, you, when you look at, for example, like shows like uh, Grey's Anatomy. Yeah. Grey's Anatomy has been around for God knows how long. And when that show started, their formula was, okay, we're going to get a bunch of, and again, these actors were actors that, you know, they were big, but they were they weren't a De Niro. They were they were yeah. they were somebody that yeah they considered to be the next person, but they didn't really work out that way. So you got, basically got a bunch of nobodies that are just yeah. working together. But then you have this incredible script, where, for example, you may get a no name actor who nobody friggin' knows today, but they play the hell out of that role, and all of a sudden now they're 
booking jobs all over the place and they're staying busy and they're they're consistently working but then you've got for example these bigger name actors when you obviously when you know like from the 80s to the 90s yep. to, to now yep. those actors from the 80s and 90s like steven seagal and shit like that like you don't hear about these guys anymore but then you've got the other guys who are as i said like yourself 30 years plus doing big doing small doing yeah. shorts doing this and so like for you like what is your advice for with your point for someone that's looking to have longevity in the acting and film and television world uh first of all you have to get your priorities straight for me my family and my kids were really what pressured me to stay in the business so I can make a living for them. My wife is a right, very successful writer producer. Um, okay. Been on shows like Big Love and and uh, uh, Suddenly Susan and actually she was nominated for an Emmy for her first job here in in uh, Hollywood. She was on okay. the original writing staff of In Living Color. Oh shit! Okay. Yeah. So so I mean so that's that's one thing but you know ellen ellen burston is probably one of the greatest actresses ever has every award there ever was she was at my house one thanksgiving and um we knew each other from new york and when i got into the actor's studio and i i, I there was a situation almost like what i was just mentioning um i was offered a a, a, a couple of episodes of walker texas ranger right okay now at the at the time in the business, everybody thought Walker was like schlock and, you know, it was, it was a great, you know, good show. It was product. It was what it was. My, my agent said, nah, you don't want to do this at this point in your career. You know? And so I read the character and I really loved the character. So okay. I thanks that Ellen was here for Thanksgiving dinner. And I said, Ellen, I said, you know, I've got my agents and, uh, you know, telling me that this is not the right time to do this show for you and your career. It's not where people go to die, but it's not, you know, and she looked at me and she goes, do you, do you like the material? And I said, yeah, I really like the material. She goes, it's about the work then, you know, it's about the work. If you mm -hmm. like what you're doing, if you love this character, something you never played before or whatever, it, then it's about the work and the money comes you know when it comes you know and mm -hmm. sometimes sometimes uh, um you know i i very often now i get scale i don't get i don't there used to be a point where um after you know late 90s or early 2000s um after i had series after series um i would get uh, i would get a nice fee for guest starring now everybody gets scale you know mm -hmm. that's it. um the only thing is now it's starting to come around for me again. People are starting to, I don't know if this is a respect uh, of, of value or not, but they're paying me a little bit more than mm -hmm. scale, you know, and so on. But again, it's about the works like this is us. This is us was nothing uh, when I started that role. And I actually had somebody from casting actually sent me an email finally and said, thank you so much for having done this role because it was nothing when it started out. And because of the way it developed, it became more, a more important, you know, entity in, in that huge show, you know, mm -hmm. and, and still very minimal work, like a couple of scenes, an episode or whatever. But the driving force and the background of that character is what drives the lead in the show, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's very rewarding for me. And I'm not getting paid money. I mean, SWAT, I was a regular I, you know, SWAT was something I did for the Flash and the money. SWAT something you want to do when you're mm -hmm. a kid. When you were a kid, mm -hmm. you want to be a cop or you want to be a cowboy or you want to be you want to shoot guns. You want to fight. You know, and, and it's what every actor wants to come in and mm -hmm. do all, all the stunts. I did all my stunts. It was great and it was a fantastic paycheck. You know, but art wise, those three or four scenes or two three scenes that I might do in an episode of This Is Us is much more of a challenge and, and much more rewarding uh, artistically, you know? Well, I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I want to get into all that too as well, but I want to, I want to go back a little bit. Obviously, you know, okay. you've, you started off, you know, as you said, with your first major film and not many people get that, you know, that opportunity on their first major film to be in such an iconic film like Goodfellas yeah. and work with, 
you know, the best of the best in the business for yeah. you landing that, that role and preparing for that. Did you obviously, you know, have nerves of, of, of working with a legend like Robert De Niro and even after working with him, did you say, okay, you know what, if I can work with him, yeah, I can work with anybody. Well, there's, there's the whole story starts out fairly tense. Um, I had just filmed, we had already moved to California. I had okay. just filmed the last episode of Kate and Allie on a Thursday night in front of a live audience. And Friday, I had a 2.30 flight out of JFK to fly back here to California for okay. my first son's birth. It, he was due, he was due that Monday. I get a call back for Scorsese in Rockefeller Center at 12.30. So <laughs> I call my wife, I go, I'm taking this call back to hell with this freaking plane mm -hmm. if I don't make it, right? Mm -hmm. So I walk in, and this is such this is such a great moment for me in my career, but it's an interesting moment in Scorsese's uh, 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 evolution as well. At that time, for the people who got small roles like I got, they gave everybody the same scene to read. And then, you know, if, if Scorsese liked you, he'd just find a character, right? Mm -hmm. Well, also at that time, for the small scenes like I got, Scorsese was hiring real mob guys or cops that chased real mob guys, right? Mm -hmm. So I walk into the outer room of this audition, and there's guys with silver sweatsuits and patent leather sneakers and cigars. <laughs> and we all, we all got the same scene, right? So uh -huh. this guy, this guy looks at me. He goes, "What are you reading for?" <laughs> <laughs> and I go, uh, "I go, well, I got the signs for Sunny Bamboo." He goes, "You know him?" I go, "No, I don't know him." He goes, "I know him. You don't look nothing like him, right?" <laughs> I said, "Well, that's what they gave me." He goes, "Okay, God bless you, kid." Right? You so sound like William DeMille right there. Yeah. You sound like my buddy William DeVere right there with the, <laughs> with the Brooklyn voice, man. Right? So, 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 then, so then I go into the office, and now you got to remember, I'd only been in the business a couple of years. Uh -huh. So when I had a meeting at McCall's or with ad agencies or whatever, I would always make, you know, we did this from retailing. You'd always make the meeting yours. No matter what it was, mm -hmm. you try to make the meeting yours. So I made up a story. Um to tell Scorsese and I said because uh, my grandfather's name is Donato Scorsese it's the okay. same spelling without the S right so I make up a story and I said uh, before we read I got to ask you if we're related because I said to my grandfather I'm, I'm going to read for the great director Martin Scorsese and my grandfather mm -hmm. said my grandfather said wow I think so. We have a cousin at one time, which had taken the S out of the name. Scorsese looks at me, goes, really? Really? Because we can't find our relatives. And I'm going, oh, I'm screwed now. <laughs> so I made up this <laughs> story. Right? I said, well, I don't know. Where are you from? He goes, well, we're from Sicily. I go, no friggin' way. We're not from Sicily. You know, he goes, where are you from? And I said, well, we're from Naples. He goes, oh, you guys drink too early in the morning. You want to do this? I go, yeah, let's do it. And so we read the scene, and I ended up getting those couple of scenes in the movie. So for you, like, yeah. obviously, you know, like you that that d definitely obviously plateaued. What was it like for you working with De Niro? I mean, I've worked with him on projects before, but what was it like for you in your first experience? And how did you come about getting the audition for that project? Uh, I got the audition just because my my agents sent me in. You know, they okay. for the first for the first audition. This was a callback for Scorsese. So the first audition was, of course, just in front of casting, and so they just called me back along with the mobsters and the cop guys to see, you know, if I fit in somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, De Niro was 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 great. I mean, he gets in the car. And he, it's two o'clock in the morning, and in in uh, uh, Park Slope, and he goes, how you doing? I'm Bobby De Niro. I go, yeah, I know. He goes, <laughs> like that, right? <laughs> so, um, so, I, so, you know, again, I, I started giving him a little shit. There was a, there was a, the first scene where they're, where they're pounding me, 
uh, and, and smacking me around. Uh, so Scorsese says to me, he comes, okay, he says, Bobby's going to punch you. Uh, no, Bobby's going to slam you into the front seat twice. Mm -hmm. then, you, then you come up, you say your first line, and he's going to punch you. Ray's going to punch you. Okay, so I say, okay, two times into the front seat, and we start the thing, right? So he goes over to camera. He goes, action. Boom. Boom. And then, boom. Cut. Scorsese comes back over, and I go, you know, I don't have to say the line. We can, we can lose the line. He goes, no, no, I want the line. I don't want to say, friggin' De Niro can't count. You said two times. He banged me in three times, right? So, <laughs> so I, don't say it. I don't say anything. I'm trying to figure out where to get the lines in, right? So then uh, it comes around, right? And um, they do the master shot through the front windshield of them, them punching me, right? So mm -hmm. they come around, and they do race close-up, and they take it from the middle of the scene, right? Mm -hmm. And then they come around to do De Niro's close-up. And he says to me, if you don't mind, I don't like to take it from the middle of the scene. I like to start from the top. And I look at him. I go, a little method, huh, Bobby? He goes, like that. <laughs> so, you know, it, it was, we had, you know, and then here's the other thing. I get into the trailer. Again, it's like 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning. And I did, a whole, I did a fitting for the three scenes that I'm in. And the wardrobe I have there, I don't recognize it. I, I didn't try that wardrobe on, right? Mm -hmm. I'm wondering where the hell's the wardrobe that I tried on. I get in the car, and De Niro has the wardrobe <laughs> that I was supposed to have. So he must have seen it and said, I like that. And they went, okay, Bobby. <laughs> you know, and, and gave it to him. They gave me something else, you know, for that first scene. But it was, it was, uh, it was, it, it really was a great, uh, um, it was a great uh, moment for me. And like you said, um, you know, you work with De Niro and you get through it and it works good and you don't get thrown off the set, you can pretty much feel like you can work on any set, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, did you did you know when you when you were shooting that that, that film would def would become literally now part of the culture, part of history, part of no. such iconic film status? No, I knew it was gonna be big because it was Scorsese and De Niro and all that stuff, but I never in a million years thought it would be like you know the preeminent you know uh, uh example of, of of mob movies you know uh it was just uh it was i had no idea and you know what i didn't even think about it i just thought about and it's funny because um i had to improvise this, where i'm in the phone booth after they beat me up mm -hmm. i had to, i had to improvise talking to the guy who had the money that i was supposed to get well i read the book and i read what this character had done this this florida bookie he had uh, he he the, he the doc a, a doctor client of his had the money and hadn't mm -hmm. given it to him yet. So I put that into my improv and Ray goes, "Where'd you get that from?" I go, "It was in the book." He goes, "Wow!" He goes, "You're really freaking prepared." I said, "Well, you know what? If I'm working with you and this guy, you know, I'm not going to come, you know, with nothing. You know, mm -hmm. bring everything I can. You know, so." Uh, yeah, so that was part of the, part of it too. And then here's the other thing: uh, was like, you know, when you when you're shooting nights, you know, your lunch hour is like three o'clock in the morning, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I get we get off for lunch, it's like a half hour. I go and they're serving friggin' lasagna, right? So I don't know when I'm going to eat again. I'm in Brooklyn. I, I you know, I, I I'm, I've got to, you know, I, I had come back out in, you know, months later to, to do it. So I was in New Jersey with my family, drove to Brooklyn to do the thing. I don't know what I'm going to eat again. So I eat lasagna, right? And uh, I come back in and De Niro gets in the car. He goes, you okay? I go, eh, you know, I ate that catering. I had, I had the lasagna. He goes, oh, no, no, no. You got to go in clean. You got to go in clean. I go, you got a freaking chef in your, your trailer. You can go in clean. I got to eat when I eat, you know? Mm -hmm. He goes, he goes. Okay. <laughs> I know for I mean for for many for many East Coast actors, New York actors, New Jersey actors based, when they when they land that first you know, I guess you would call it Goomba movie, you know yeah. where they're playing either a mobster. A lot of them, especially, you know they they stay in that comfort zone. They stay yeah continuing to book those type of projects and those roles. And for you, obviously, you know, having that swagger of a mobster, of, you know, 
the play of that era of a gangster and then to decide to take the jump to LA where it's completely different typecasting. What was your decision process making and why did you not do what other people do who obviously land those type of roles, stay in that, in that lane? Uh, I'll tell you, it wasn't really my decision because again, mm -hmm. I go back to what Ellen said, it's about the work. But when I got here, my only background was sitcom and that one small role in, uh, in Goodfellas. So then my mentor, and may he rest in peace, Bochco got a hold of me, and he made mm -hmm. me one of his leading men. And that was at the time when Jimmy Smith, who I'm still friends with, was big on L.A. Law and all those guys, you know, and – all of a sudden, I get this this crazy show called Cop Rock. I'm about to get right into that. Before, I'm, I, I, as as for the for the audience, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna play something for you, <laughs> and, and because it, because I love this show, and 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 this 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 was to me one of the most iconic scenes in television. And I want you to see if you still remember if you still remember this. Hold on. Okay. Yep. I absolutely. I one. You got a beautiful voice, man. What? Tell people who who, who are not familiar with the show Cop Rock how great this, this show was, and and, and of course playing that specific scene. Did you did you have a singing yeah. background before you sung that? No, I I sang at two friends' weddings. That was it. I was actually probably the one of the only untrained singers in the whole ensemble uh and and i was scared shitless to do it you, you uh, killed it man you uh, killed it you killed but, you it know, and 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 that particular scene we actually filmed those are all real prisoners we filmed that in the honor rancho up in uh up in uh, um, um silmar up there uh, so for those who aren't familiar with the show cop rock explain it to them what what the show was about so it was, uh, like we say, law and order, rhythm and blues. It was, uh, um, it was a show that had all the well-written drama of Hill Street Blues and uh, NYPD. But mm -hmm. there were five songs in each show that sometimes, hopefully, advanced the plot and other times didn't work. And, um, and it was the most magnificent opportunity of my career again not being a singer uh and having this role and and my role was supposed to go out after four episodes my character was supposed to sing a love song to his gun and blow his brains out right mm -hmm. and so i went and i wanted to be in movies that's why i came to california I went, well this is a great way to go out of television but my character tested so well in the pilot that abc came back to botchko and said this guy's got to be a regular so the whole 10 or 12 episodes ended up revolving around what I did in that first pilot episode, kill the cop killer and, mm -hmm. and the court case and everything. Um, and it was, and here's the thing people don't know. We had two Academy award winning songwriters on our writing staff. We had Donnie Markowitz who wrote time of my life for dirty dancing. Okay. And we had Amanda McBroom who wrote the Rose uh, uh, you know, um, in the movie that wrote, wrote the song that won the Academy Award, and <clears throat> we it was just, and we had people on there like 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 Carl Anderson who played Judas in in the movie Jesus Christ Superstar, mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, um, oh Cheryl Crow sang background in two episodes. You know, mm -hmm. it, it was tons of talent around there. You know. And I always said, I, I said to my managers, I said to my wife and kids, I said, someday I want to get an Emmy just so I can stand up there and say, thank you very much, but Cop Rock is the best thing I ever did. You know? <laughs> it's a great, it was a great show. It was a and great, you know what? great show. About four years ago, my manager calls me. She goes, somebody sent you something from the Midwest here. It's a tear sheet from a newspaper. I'll drop it off. She drops it off and it's a tear sheet from, I don't know where the hell it was in the Midwest. And it had a picture of, of, jane lynch and it said 
before there was Glee, and on the bottom there was a picture of me and Larry Joshua. It said, there was Cop Rock. Nice. Guys, so don't forget, check, turn me to fall break. Guys, don't forget, if you're just hopping in tonight, tonight, Peter Onorati from SWAT, and this is us inside the building. My host, my man, is in the building. Don't forget, you can join us each and every Sunday for Hollywood actors, directors, producers in conversation. I'm your host, D. Tuffle, on the MIC. Don't forget, if you have a question for Peter, we'll be answering it towards the end of this show tonight. If you guys want to get on and ask him a question live and direct, I'll be taking some callers towards the end of the show. You have to do two things. You have to be following at D-T-E-F-L-O-N and also be following at Hot Topic Celeb TV. Continue, man. So that was Cop Rock. And then um, when that went down, um, I got a call from Stephen saying that, hey, ABC is going to call you. Uh, they want to make a holding deal. And I went, what is that? <laughs> you know, because, <laughs> you know, they said, well, they're going to pay you to hold you for an ABC show, you know. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, I, I didn't know people did that, you know. And uh, and then Civil Wars came up. And um, and I said to Stephen, I said, you know, I'd like to. I'd like to be considered for Civil Wars with Mario Hemingway. Mario Hemingway wasn't wasn't cast yet, and it was to play a lawyer. Which you know, I mean, I had I, I had law at undergraduate. I had law in, during my MBA, and you know, it's something I always I always loved the law. I just wasn't conscientious enough a student to become a lawyer. You know, mm -hmm. um, so they ended up considering me for the role, and and uh, I got it. And then they cast Marielle after they cast Debbie Mazur um, in yeah. Civil War. And it's funny because we met in the hallway in Bochco's building. I said, Debbie, I said, you were great in Goodfellas. She goes, you were in Goodfellas too. I said, yeah. I said, but not like you. You know, it was a great role, you know. Mm -hmm. And David, Mar David Marciano was a good friend from Jersey. Uh, we used to finish each other's jokes. Uh, he he was uh, uh, part of the cast. It was uh, the uh, the four of us were the uh, original um, uh, regulars on uh, Civil Wars. And I got to do great stuff beautiful law legalese and summations and and it was a really good show and it only lasted two years but the, but that's just goes to the point that Bochco is the one who sort of made a leading man career for me you know well i know for you obviously you know playing on all spectrums of the mediums from prime time and and motion picture film and you know playing on shows like you know, SWAT, This Is Us, Law and Order, you know, all these different types of, you know, syndicates yeah. and, and, and being very lucky to be able to jump aboard some iconic shows over your long career. What would you say for yourself the differences between working in motion picture film and primetime? Um, for me, uh, if you're talking about being a series regular, as when you say prime time for me mm -hmm. the greatest thing um uh, about that is that's your character you are that character you show up with that character and it continues on and you get to explore the life of that character and uh, both in the present and the past because the past informs what you do in the present uh in, in terms of a film the thing that makes film the greatest thing is you get to be that person for that one film mm -hmm. and you get to go off and do something that you might not do for instance one of the best jobs I've ever had was a movie that I did with Charlie Durning and Kurtwood Smith. It was called Shelter. And I got to play a Greek mobster. I spoke in Greek. I spoke with a, a Greek uh, American accent. And actors at my level don't get to do that kind of shit, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you just save that for, you know, the upper echelons. And so for me to be able to do that and to do that work for that character and to speak in another language and that to me was what what acting was all about it was a wonderful opportunity and working with charlie durning you know academy award nominee and and kurtwood smith who's a great actor been around for a long time it was just it was just a great opportunity so so that's the kind of movie anybody would aspire to you know uh um and then and then like i said civil wars was the kind of series that someone would aspire to because 
you got to see my father. We had an episode one time where I bought my father a car because he had cancer and he told me to take it back. He said, you make me feel like I'm dying, you know? Mm -hmm. and it was so wonderful to have to explore that, that relationship with somebody as my father, you know? And, and, uh, and how I would feel if my father, who always did tell me every time I gave him a gift, take it back, you know? <laughs> you know? You spent too much. I go, come on. I'm like, you know, I'm 40 years old. Take a friggin' gift and shut up, will you? You know? So those are the great things about series television. You get to create an ongoing life, you know, and explore all mm -hmm. the possibilities of it. In the film, it's just a short lived, but it's, it, you get an opportunity sometimes to do things that are further away from you. What did you find the more difficult medium between the two? Uh, I, I found series television more difficult only because the the volumes of work uh, on the script that come through, especially in a law show, you know, pages and pages of the summation, um, you know, and all that stuff. The same thing, you know, if, if you have a big episode of SWAT and you're on every page, you know, that's hard. It's harder. It's harder to get into the work when you're just trying to get the words down, you know, you don't have, and, and mm -hmm. you, know, you got to film, you know, 10 pages the next day um mm -hmm. you don't really have enough time that's why if you've worked on the character before hopefully it you know the character comes to you with those 10 pages the next day but you don't get to really explore it as much as you would if it was a one-shot deal you know mm -hmm. i mean I, for me obviously you know like my brother from another shamar you know with you guys over on swat what was that ex how one for you like what attracted you first to that role and second, what was the experience like been working with such, you know, because obviously whenever you do anything of a remake of anything, there's always going to come with, you know, yeah. one, the pressure of not bombing it and making right. it sh something shit. Right. And two, obviously, you know, um, trying, especially when you're playing, you know, cop related series of getting it accurate, getting it, you know, properly done a way that actual yeah. offer because you're going to get that criticism obviously from police yeah. officers or watchers saying oh that doesn't happen and this is fake and that doesn't yeah. go on what yeah. were you one attracted to and what was the, the process experience for you working on that show and making it authentic okay first of all i didn't audition for mumford i auditioned for another role and uh the role was buck who loses yeah. who in the first episode, loses mm -hmm. Shamar's mentor. Um, and I figured I, I didn't get it because I didn't hear anything. So I went to New York and I got a call. I was in New York City uh, at my cousin's apartment. And my agents and managers said, listen, they want you for Mumford. And I said, M Mumford's a regular, you know? Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and they, and they said, yeah. And they said, they want you to go put something down on tape. I said, I'm in New York City. I got no place to go. It's, it's six o'clock at night. My agents aren't even open. I can't go in. And they said, wait right there. So they hung up and then they called me back and they said, listen, they're going to use your audition for Buck to test against these other people's audition for Mumford to see. And then they called me an hour later and said, you got the job. Uh, they're going to have a reading tomorrow in L.A. And I went, shit, I got to get on an overnight, uh, you know to LA because, you know, they did me a solid by, you know, just using my old tape instead of having me go out and audition. So I had to be there. So I cut my whole, my whole time in New York short, flew back and I played Mumford, you know? And uh, mm -hmm. now the other thing, the other thing you were asking about, we have a, a, a technical advisor uh, who was San Diego SWAT. His name is Otis Gallup. We call him Odie. Um, okay. He is, he and, and another guy uh, were just, phenomenal with us they trained us before we started shooting you know they showed us how to do everything and uh, to enter rooms and to clear and to do everything um so we had about a week or two of training in the heat of santa clarita with full gear and all that stuff which was great for me i'd never done, had to do that for a role before mm -hmm. cool you know um and so he always kept us honest he and and we were and you know both shamar and i and and all the guys, we would go to, if the director wanted us to do something, we would go to Odie and we'd say, 
Is that right? You know? Mm -hmm. and unfortunately for Odie, after a season or two, he had to stop, start lying and, and say, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's okay. Because, <laughs> you know, I mean, they just were like, come on, let's get this thing shot. It's like we were talking about before, New York versus L.A., no process. Get the shot. <laughs> hit, hit your mark. Say, you know, say uh -huh. your, uh, your words and, and collect your check, you know. Um, but it was uh, – but it was just a wonderful experience. It was so, I loved the action. I loved the character. I loved playing the old man. It was the first time I ever played the old man. The only bad thing about it was I, I had to leave the second season. You know, otherwise, uh, I wish I had gotten a full second season and then they retired me. But they retired me. Uh, you know, mid was that your choice or was that? No, their... no, that was their choice. They, they, you know, I think they. We had competing teams, and Otis Odie would always say that this was a great dynamic because they would always bust each other. You yeah, know? it was. It was. <laughs> I think that's, I think that's what they originally wanted, but then it got to the point where they wanted to see some more of Shamar's team in action all the time. So mm -hmm. they're not going to write for my team, you know, unless I'm helping Shamar, you know, or mm -hmm. if there's some sort of plot point about, the evolution of a person as a SWAT officer that I've gone through and he hasn't and the confrontation that is needed, then they bring me in, you know? So they just didn't want to write for my character anymore, you know? Uh, because so I, I always felt your character, like even to me, like I was thinking about it the other day, I was like, I, I always believed that that character, especially when you came back for that cameo to solve that yeah. case, I yeah. always believed that like Mumford would have played a great, like, teacher in in the SWAT academy yeah. there like well, yeah, or training, for yeah. me yeah. it's like a training officer or for me the way that I look at it if I was writing for that show which I would love to if I was writing for and I was writing for your character how I would how I would bring him back right now would be a case similar like what you were you were right cold case connected to but a case that where somebody was targeting you, like right. somebody you put away years ago that right. was holding a grudge. And right. then eventually it, it, it led to the point of where, you know, he's got to come out of yeah. retirement per se yeah. to defend and, and protect, or I'd break it down in a second option where they were to me, they, they, they were going with it with Buck, but they didn't really pull the trigger. Right. And I think that where when you talk about mental health nowadays yeah. with police officers, I would have rather Mumford not go out as gracefully, but have some sort of after a bit of time, yeah. some sort of psychological break where he comes back into SWAT headquarters. Right. And basically like is about to kill himself. But yeah. he's in the room where he where he locks down the actual SWAT headquarters. He holds yeah. his own his own team at gunpoint, where right. Shamar and Team One have to come in there and, and negotiate with yeah. Mumford to decide, okay, whether we don't want to kill our own. Yeah. But how are we going to resolve this situation? I think it would have been something that could have been epic yeah. storytelling, not only for just the show, because I mean what I've what I've realized with, and I've had this conversation with Shamar, is that like where the first season, and exactly what you said, you know, with 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 Odie, is that you know where it was sort of figuring out the gears of right. like where things aren't really because the first you know couple first two seasons it was kind of like you know the script wasn't really there, like it really wasn't there to the to the extent, and now I think with COVID. So right. I think, you know, a lot of people were like, how the hell are they going to shoot, you know, when this show is so action-based? Yeah. And I think with COVID, it allowed the show to slow down. Yeah. And really start dissecting each character one at a time and telling the stories of each from, you know, from Lena to, to Jay's yeah. character. And yeah. each episode had something focusing. And I think, you know, where... Your character, and, and, and to me, I, I love the dynamic of you and Hicks together in the sense, number one, just yeah. the, of two old guys that are like, you know, 
Yeah. They, 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 they have a way of doing things the way it was done right. the right way. And then there's these new younger cowboys that come into play. And I think that's where, to me, it's like what I don't like now about storytelling and when it comes to television, and maybe you can comment on this, is that when you started way back when on a series, it was a slow race. It was, it was, it was a buildup. It was where you had an ep a, se a season one, like 24, for example, where yeah. you knew where it was going to go at some point, but it wasn't all trying to be rushed and crammed into one right. season. Like you wanted that week to week anticipation going, this is, this is a, this is a, this is a slow race. But now it looks like television where it's, as you say, it's less on script. It's less on story. It's more about theatrics and, and, and blowing shit up and, 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 and not really paying attention to the art of storytelling. Do you feel now in the industry that storytelling for most of these showrunners doesn't matter anymore when it comes to primetime? Uh, I can't. I, I can't speak for the showrunners, but I will say that if if they are plagued by that, it's probably because the network edict is for them to do that. You just said at the top of our conversation, we were talking about the internet and immediate uh, uh, reinforcement of, of you know of, of people wanting to be a star immediately. Everything mm -hmm. is immediate like that. Well, that's filtered in to the network mindset in programming a show. You won't see that on a Netflix show. You won't see that on, uh, you know, an Amazon show because they're not, you know, they're not under the same restraints. Mm -hmm. The network shows are an extension of the internet basically now. When I got SWAT, CBS called me and they said, do you have Twitter? Do you have Instagram? Do you have Facebook? <laughs> I, go, I, got, I got Facebook and Twitter, but I don't have Instagram. They go, get it. Um, Cause we're going to be shipping you stuff to put on there. I went, okay. You know, it's like what you said, you know, um, you know, some people may get cast by the amount of followers they have rather than the, their work. You know, who knows? But well, that's the I thing, think, because it, I exactly think what you're saying yeah. is, is a case that mostly deals with um, the networks. Another show that doesn't do that, though, is This Is Us. It takes its time to develop, you know, and it, it flashes back and it gives you information and that kind of stuff. But for the most part, I think the network edict to all these shows is to get there faster, get, you know, get, you know, I mean, some of the shit that they do on SWAT, man, these these stunts are unbelievable. <laughs> they blow up something every episode. It's great. It's great mm -hmm. to watch. But you can see that they've shifted to that. And it, instead of uh, doing what you said they were doing for a little while, is getting into Chris's character, getting into, you know. See, and like you said, back when I started, for instance, Botchko and his whole organization, they cast me in a pilot. Mm -hmm. uh, of cop rock and of civil wars and the process was the same they started writing that character but when they saw where my strengths and weaknesses were they changed and altered their writing to my strengths and to and to my weaknesses and mm -hmm. but nobody has time to do that anymore especially on a network show they just don't allow you that shit they want they want this many things blown up per episode they want Shamar to smile this many times. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, really, it's, it's come to a formulaic point where, uh, uh, and again, I, I, I really think that's, that's, that's network. Because, you know, I, I, I sold this show when we were doing the upfronts. We were in New York getting interviewed. And everybody said, well, what's the show? I said, well, I said, it, it's, it's, you got, you know, you got the glitz of a network and you got the guts of, of cable because you got Sean Ryan and Aaron Rashawn Thomas running the show, you know, and they never really got to do that as, much mm -hmm. as, as they could have, because they're certainly capable of it. I mean, Sean wrote, uh, wrote uh, the, the shield and Aaron did Southland. I mean, they have it in them. Mm -hmm. but you get on a, the network show, baby, you get thrown into the machine and you crank, you know, that's the way it goes. Do you feel the networks metal too much now? In, 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 into these I've, shows? I've always felt, uh, even as a marketing person and not an actor, I've felt that the networks have meddled too much. Look, 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 let's take, for example, how a show gets canceled, right? 
show doesn't get these numbers, it gets canceled, gone. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, if you're going to, now you get into my area. My MBA is in market research. I don't understand how to do uh, TV and radio research. I understand all that stuff. So my, my theory and or, or my postulate is this. If you're going to kill a show by the numbers, then you have to save a show by the numbers. And by that, I mean, go to Cheers, go to Hill Street Blues, go to all these shows, Seinfeld, that were on the chopping block and had the worst numbers in the world and were given a chance and became the icons of programs. Hold on, you, okay? you cut out there. So you, you, you cut I out, said, you're cutting out. So, so, okay, how about now? Any better? Any better? Uh, but, yeah, better. Okay. Yeah. So what I was saying was, if you're going to use numbers to cancel a show, you have to use numbers to save a show. You have the icons of programming, Cheers and Hill Street and, and Seinfeld. All were on the chopping block. All were mm -hmm. ready to be canceled. But somebody at the network said, let's give them a chance. And they became iconic, mm -hmm. you know. But they were they didn't have the numbers, you know. It, that's what I'm saying, you know. Then, and so when one network network, you know, operates on money and uh, art is not necessarily uh, uh, the same thing, <laughs> you know. Did you did you when you obviously when you came to SWAT, did you guys like know or did you for even for yourself? Did you feel that instant chemistry right away that you guys had something special together? Yes. Yes, I, I did. I did. And, and, and uh, one of the things was the fact that we were training together first. That really put us, you know, that put us in a space where we were together. And I have to say one thing. Uh, I, I have to say that uh, one of the reasons we came together the way we did is Shamar. Um, out of all the shows I've had of my own or been on, you know, number one on the call sheet, Shamar is number one. He's mm -hmm. probably he's probably one of the best number ones I've ever been around. He knows how to keep spirits up in a set, and he knows how to talk yeah. to certain people who are. Uh, we had an incident uh, right before we aired. We had an incident. He pulled me up, and he said to the rest of the cast, "We had just gotten done filming something downtown." He says, "Let me tell you something." He says, "Next year, next week, when this show airs." Your lives are all going to change. Ask this guy, meaning me. And, mm -hmm. and, and so what he was trying to say was this little rift that might have been going on between one or two people needed to go away. And we needed to act as a unit, as people and individuals, as much as we do as a SWAT team on television. Mm -hmm. And he made that point, and I give him credit for it. And he used to do stuff like the first year. He would get everybody, he'd throw everybody's name in the hat, and he'd get out uh, in the parking lot at lunchtime yeah. and throw a football up as high as he could. And somebody would catch it. they catch it. they get 50 bucks, you know. Mm -hmm. And everybody's out there cheering. I've never seen anything like that before. So I give him a lot of credit as being one of the best number ones on the call sheet that I've ever known, you know. No, I, I, said, I, I've, known, I, I've known Chance for over 20 years, man. And the one thing yeah. I can say about him, which I love him because he's like a brother, is that, you know, he – he has an ability, you know, when you're going through something, you're going through shit. And, like, there's times we've traveled and, and, and gone to party somewhere in another city, and you could be having, like, a mental breakdown. But, like, he has a way of just being able to turn yeah. whatever shit you're going through yeah. and say, okay, you know what? Put that shit over there. We're yeah. going we're gonna, to we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna celebrate and celebrate life and celebrate the wins and I and, and I was for me I I was so proud of him, just landing this opportunity because you know I've said to him for years I'm like you know, he's always been chasing that dream, to be yeah. you know the Denzel the the, the Jamie Fox yeah. and I and I and I say to him all the time I said Shamar I said look, you go to your Instagram and you got you know fifty thousand women leaving comments yeah. going crazy etc cetera, etc cetera. and that's all good and dandy, but yeah. what do you want to be remembered for? Looking yeah. good and having a nice body, yeah. or the work, like because yeah. when you think of Denzel and you think of Samuel Jackson, you think of you know yeah. all these these icons. No one's sitting there. Yeah, they're good looking men, but no one's yeah. complimenting Morgan Freeman on how hot he is. <laughs> they're complimenting him on his work and the work that he puts out. And you know yeah. when 
Samuel Jackson does something that's going to be iconic, and, and sure. Denzel Washington does something that's going to be iconic. And I said, this, for you, is an opportunity that in our business as right. a black man, let yeah. alone on CBS as right. a black man, you're only going to get one opportunity at this, like one right. opportunity to either swing for the fence and, right. and, and do it right where they look and say, oh, because obviously, you know, prior to that show, his reputation of partying, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. was out there. And, 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 yeah. and you know as well as I do in the business, when you come with that stereotype over your head, networks yeah. are like, eh, I don't really know if I can, this guy's going to show up to work on time or whether he's going to yeah. be, you know, yeah. ready. And, and, and I said to him, I go, look, you have this opportunity here to not only open the door for other black creators in the business, producers, et cetera, et cetera, to be given that opportunity, that trust factor, to say, yeah. hey, we're putting the ball in your hand. Because I said, when you look at, you know, in our industry, and as I said, as black performers, yeah, there's only a few, and I, I would even say, like, because everyone always says, when we're getting another Denzel. When yeah. we get another, and I'm like, we don't need another Denzel. Like, right. Denzel is Denzel, and that's Denzel. But when I look at, in the sense of guys who have been a guy that's where I said, there's celebrity, right, and there's working. And when I look at black performers, we've had everyone from Boris Kojo on Station 19, he was supposed to be the guy. Then right. we had Morris Chestnut, he was supposed to be the guy. Then yeah. there was Shamar, and he was supposed to be the guy. And I yeah. said, when all those guys crossed over to try to do film, they stuck in the same narrative. They did the black film cultures, the Tyler Perry yeah. movies. But then there's one yeah. guy. There's one guy, number one, that I said, if you're going to follow a blueprint to really be able to have yourself an opportunity to really seize it by the horn, look yeah. at the Tay Diggs blueprint. Because when you look at Tay Diggs as an actor, yeah, that guy can play gay. He can play straight. Yeah. He can play whatever you want him to play. And he's going to kill it. And I said, yeah, and I said, you know, that's yeah. where you where where you when you have a show because again, it really started the show for you guys. I think in the second season, yeah. that commodity and and what I loved with your character was that that relationship with Rocker, you know, because it was and, yeah. and to me, I what I didn't like of where they writ that is that they could have explored that sure even more where you know what like where. Mumford may know his time is coming, but yeah. how is he like Apparently. passing on his, his knowledge of preparing Rocker to be the right. team leader? Not just saying, okay, well, I'm handing it over to Rocker. And yeah. <laughs> you're in a parking lot driving away in a car. Like, that's yeah. where to me, I'm like, yeah. I think that now the networks need to understand that, like, when you build an audience, and again, I mean, a lot of people I know, your fan base was very disappointed for you to leave. It, it, yeah. Do you ever feel like that it could they, they could they could change that decision and hopefully bring you back on a full time basis? Uh, yeah, I mean, of course, I I felt that way, uh, but um, you know, I don't think there'll ever be a full time basis. I think it'll be a one shot deal like that last episode and whatever. But um, um, but yeah, I mean, listen, I there one of the best things about the character of Mumford is that he provided an opportunity for Shamar, okay, to act. Mumford is the only one in that entire show mm -hmm. that has the gravitas and the experience to be able to challenge Hondo. Everybody else that's above him, he has to take orders from. He has to take orders from Hicks. He had to take orders from Stephanie's character. Mm -hmm. Mumford was the only one at his level who had gone through the things that he was going through that could challenge him, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's what made Mumford in interesting for me and, and why I felt um, that, that, that he could have been used more. You know what I mean? Out of all your roles that you've played, you know, in, in prime time, what for you is your, your most favorite? Wow. Um,
You're frozen. Okay. I don't okay. know what happened there. Yeah. Uh, I tried to plug the, the phone in so to make sure that the battery's okay. I don't even know. Okay. Anyway, I, I think aside from cop rock, because it's something that nobody gets to do, um, I, I really loved playing a lawyer. I loved playing uh, uh, Charlie Howell on Civil Wars. I really okay. did. Yeah, it was, again, it was a challenge. It was a challenge of learning the law. And I love, I mean, I really love the law. And, and You're frozen again. You're frozen. This is happening. Uh, I'm plugged in and everything. Uh, How's your signal? Should be fine. It's in the same place, uh, you know. How many? How many bars? Does it say how many bars is on your phone? No, I can't see that without. I, 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 oh, okay. I'm trying to set the phone up so so I can keep the uh, keep it plugged in. You know, uh, it's so weird. I don't have a stand for. It. Oh, you don't have a you don't have a stand? No, I have. Uh, okay, you know, there. I'm gonna have to ship you one for. You have to send me your address. I'll ship you one for Christmas. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, I don't know. It's uh, it, 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 Charlie. I was great playing a lawyer. It, it was great because I really did love the law, and I was always interested in it. Um, and the challenges because this was family law, and it was it was so wonderful to see how um, how the law, uh, the letter of the law, applies to the emotional and 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 cultural. Uh, 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 factors in family and society. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the law, the law is cold, man. It has to read a certain way. Um, and it doesn't always work in the most uh, uh, benevolent way, but it works, you know? And, uh, and that was the great thing about playing uh, Charlie Howells because it was always a family uh, or, or a, a, you know, a, a relationship thing. It wasn't criminal law per se, you know? I'm going to, I'm going to do a game with you quickly here. And it's going to be okay. one word association. Okay. And I want you to think of the first thing that comes to your head when I name off these names. So okay. give, me, give me one second here. All right. Uh, okay. Hold on. Okay. Uh, okay. Kenny Johnson. I didn't hear it. What? You're frozen. Okay, you're back now. Okay. Okay, one word association. Okay. Ken Kenny Johnson. Raw. Alex Russell. Uh, smile. <laughs> Lena Esco. Uh, beauty. Jay Harrington. Level. Shamar Moore. Right. David Lim. Sweet. Lou Ferrigno Jr. Buddy. Robert De Niro. Class. Kim Cattrall. Body. Justin Hartley. Justin Hartley. Nice. <laughs> okay i'm gonna ask you some, these or some other random questions here okay if you could learn right. the answer to one question about your future what would the question be when am i gonna die time freezes for everyone but you for one day what do you do I'm sorry, time freezes for everyone, so it freezes for me for one day? It freezes for everyone but you. Oh, You're the only person that can move around and do whatever. What do you oh, do? Man. Fly to Italy. What is something you're obsessed with? Success. What's your favorite way when you're not working to waste time? Favorite way when I'm not working to waste time is... Uh, a cigar and a drink. Favorite drink? Martini. Vi a potato vodka martini. What is something that is very popular now that annoys you? 
uh, cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do to get rid of stress? Wow. Um, I take a bath. Three words that best describe you. Loyal. Uh, industrious. Mm -hmm. And hopefully creative. Where is the most beautiful place you've ever been on vacation? Hmm. I would say the Amalfi Coast of Italy. Where is the most relaxing place you've ever been? Hmm. Um, the Jersey Shore. What word or saying from either the 60s, 70s, 80s, or 90s do you wish would come back? Hmm. Word or saying? Uh, word or thing from the 60s, 70s, 80s, or 90s. Uh, Could be from any era. Um, uh, 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 Chrome. What was the last movie you watched? Oh, um, it was... Uh, oh, um, <laughs> T uh, Turner Classics, Robin Hood with uh, Tyrone Power. <laughs> do you prefer, since we've all been in COVID, do you prefer to watch movies in the comfort of your home or in a theater? I'm, 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 I, I like home. What's the last funny video you saw? Man, I don't, I, geez. Um, my kids probably showed me one on TikTok or something. I can't <laughs> He's, uh, it, I, I think it was, uh, I don't know. It was this one, something with a dog. I can't remember what was that. <laughs> <laughs> What's a secret talent that you do that you've never shared with your fans or the audience? What would they would know? A secret talent a secret, that you have. A, talent a secret that you talent have. that I, yeah. Well, I had a secret talent that I don't do anymore that I would never, that I've never shared. And that is, I played the accordion. Wow. You still play it? Some, some people don't call that a talent. Um, I, I don't pick it up anymore. I've, I've been challenged to do so. But I used to play gigs with my teacher when I was, I started when I was four years old. And I played till I was 14. And, uh, and uh, then I quit because I was in high school. And I was like, who the hell wants to play the accordion in high school? Listen, when the world opens up and, 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 and we're allowed to do like private events again, I'm, I, I do these charity events. I'm going to send you a ticket and invite you to one, and you're going to bring that accordion. You're going to play at, that, at this private <laughs> event, 100%. I better, um, I, better, I better pull it out of the cellar. And... You better start practicing. I'm going to hold you to it. Trust me. Um, what's a song that you, well, from any era, whenever you hear it, puts you in a good mood? B.J. Tom is hooked on a feeling. What's a song, every time you hear it, any error, brings a tear to your eye that makes you really emotional? Um, uh, 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 what a Wonderful World, um, Louis Armstrong's version. Who was the first band or musician you were really into? First band was... Um, was the Beach Boys that I was really into. And the, the first single that I was really into was Bobby Darren. Good man. Yeah. What are the three, since I know this is, this is going to be a funny question to you since you don't like phones. What are the three best apps on your phone? Vivino. What's that? It's an it's a app uh, where I, I check out, I have a wine cellar. So I check out how, uh, how good the wines are that I have down there and how much they're worth. You just take a picture and it's a, so it's a wine app. It's okay. Uh, yeah. So for Vino, um, <laughs> the, uh, Google maps <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, let's see what else. Oh, I have uh, Spotify. Okay. Um, my, my, my son's game Spotify that saved my life. Cause I play all my own music. An app mysteriously appears on your phone right now, and it does something amazing. What does it do? 
teaches me how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> what is a fashion trend from when you were growing up that you were really glad went away? Uh, High-waisted elephant bell pants and acetate shirts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And platform shoes. What is the most comfortable piece of clothing that you own? Um, that would be an Armani uh, suit. Okay. Obviously, everyone, when they, you know, when they first book their first big paycheck, when they first land something in the business, a lot of people go out and they buy something really ridiculous. What was the most ridiculous thing you ever bought in your career with money that you made from a project? Man, uh, you know, with three kids, I never bought anything ridiculous. I think, oh, I know. I'll tell you what, it's ridiculous, but it wasn't because it was expensive. When I went back to New York mm -hmm. um, to, um, to do the exteriors for Civil Wars, when I was finally in my career, I was making some big money with the pilot and stuff. I went to um, Grand Central Station, which was right across from my offices. I was in I was in the Helmsley building on Park Avenue when I was at McCall's. And I used to always go buy Hoffritz cutlery. And I used to always think, man, this shit's way too expensive. So I went <laughs> when I had the money and I bought myself a really expensive nail clipper. <laughs> from Hoffritz cutlery. <laughs> That's a first. I've never heard someone better money on a nail clipper. I still got it. It was way too expensive for a nail clipper, but I bought it. If you could call up anyone in the world, living or dead, and have a one-hour conversation with, who would you call? Einstein. Obviously, the world's been opening up again slowly. And we're all, you know, getting back on flights. So if you were to, if I was to book you a ticket right now, go on a 10-hour flight, and you could pick one person to sit next to you, who would it be and why? Uh, honestly, it would be my wife because she knows how to travel with me. And, 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 and beyond the fact that she's my wife, you know, we, we have fun traveling together. And I'd Who is your favorite... <laughs> Listen, man, happy wife, happy life, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Who who is your favorite growing up or even now? Your favorite entertainer, comedian, musician, an actor that you like love his work that you watch where you're like it inspires you. Um, etc. So you want one person or it could be one person from each of those categories? One person from each of those categories. Okay. Comic, so, comedian, musician, actor. Uh, until recently, honest to God, I would have said comedian Bill Cosby because I loved his work when I was younger. I have all his records. Um, I don't know what to say now, except for he was my favorite comedian, and I and I always felt you know uh, that he understood uh, a lot about about things. Uh, um, actor. Um, I would say Robert Duvall because I, I love his diversified career and all the stuff that he's done and written as well as anything else. Um, was there another one? Is, uh, and a comedian? Oh, musician. musician. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I, I would Tony Bennett. If you right now were to write and cast your own autobiography movie mm -hmm. actor living or dead who would you cast for yourself well <laughs> i'd probably cast the guys that got me the work when i first got into business tony danza uh yeah i would say like tony danza or uh uh I always felt like James Franco and I had some sort of synergy, but I don't know him, you know, but one of those two guys. Yeah. Obviously, you, you know, you, you've been a, a guy who's, who's been actively fit 
and, and, and stayed, you know, obviously in amazing shape throughout your entire career. And obviously in this business, it's very hard to obviously maintain, because again, it's a business that you don't get a lot of sleep, <laughs> you don't get a lot yeah. of rest, and, and, you're, and it's go, go, go. What has been your formula that you have attributed to, to staying so fit and as well, obviously, you know, being a, a Jack guy, has it ever been a problem for you in castings? Like getting typecasted in the sense of, you know, or no, not getting a role there, because I I don't think I've ever not gotten a role because of of uh, my physical shape. I think my managers plenty of times have said, you know, you got to stop working out so much. I went, yeah, sure. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> Mike Chiklis gets the shield and he gets a trainer. You know, uh, you know. So I'm like, well, you, you know, see what happens? I said, no, this is who I am, you know, and this is, uh, this is what I am, you know, and I'll mm -hmm. be that way forever. And because, because the reason I do this is not for the business. I do it for me. And mm -hmm. the only way I get to do it is, and I tell my sons this because they're, you know, they're working out at two, but not as intense as I do, but working out has to be habit. And then it's not working out anymore. So you plan your life according to your habits and whether you get a job or not. I mean, there, I remember one time at uh, uh, when I was on Civil Wars, it was getting difficult for me to find time because I was a lead and I had all those pages to do to, to work out. So I got a membership right at the gym that was outside the Fox lot. And I went on my lunch hour and I told them, I said, look, guys, you hired me because I look a certain way. You know, if I don't look that way, I'm not going to feel good about myself i'm not going to act I mean, just let me have a little extra time at lunch and i'll go work i'll get my workouts done at lunchtime if i mm -hmm. can't get you know done at night and that worked out you know um and of course shamar had the uh, the trailer put up a swat which was great i i didn't really use it that much because my habit is at the gym you know mm -hmm. but uh, but that's the thing you know I, I i think working out has to be a habit and then it's not a workout anymore you know what has made what has made you stay so disciplined to it though? Um, uh, maybe it's a a a, a, a little bit of uh, a vanity. Uh, I always tell everybody, you know, I, I always worked out for my health, and that's true. I mean, I always worked out to stay healthy and to feel a certain way. But after sixty, it's for vanity. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, and and you know, I. I, I just, I want to be the guy, you know, sometimes it's interesting to me that when I walk into a room and meet somebody new, either in the business or not, mm -hmm. or somebody who's known me, known of me before, but not met me face, face to face, I, I'm, I'm a paradox to them. I look like I'm going to be a certain way and I'm not, I'm completely opposite. And that thing I like the most, I love busting up people's expectations, you know, uh, and so that's that's a kick for me, for people to expect certain things of me because of the way I look, and then me be completely different if I am, which I think I am. Well, and that's and that's the thing. I mean, I think you you hit the nail on the head earlier that you know when you when you came to SWAT, and I was so happy when I because I I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Station 19, as so I was I was oh, ecstatic yeah. when I saw you pull up on that show, but it's like for me, I, I love the fact exactly what you said. Like you bring a different stereotype of breaking down those those walls because it's like when i when i look at obviously your presence and you know when people who again who who don't know your work as well way i do and, and have followed your career you know and and they would assume as i said being a guy from the east yeah. coast yeah. most people as i said they they they, they, they oh he's going to be another goomba and you know, but you've been able yeah. to, to always play these diverse characters. So for you, what attracts you first one, one two poop part question. What attracts you to a script? And do you have a process in how you prepare for each project? Okay, so so in general terms, of course, what attracts me to the script is a character. Sometimes I don't even read the whole script. Uh, uh, I look at the character first because okay. 
I, uh, and unless there's something in the scenes from that character that really is relatable to the rest of the script, I don't read the rest of the script right away. I, I, I want to see if I like the character. If I like the character or if I think it's interesting to me or if I think it'd be a great job to do, that's what makes me decide, you know? Sometimes even when I have just a small bite here and there, uh, like on a guest star or something, I won't even read the whole script uh, if, if nothing that's in my scenes pertains to that because I don't want to have an attitude about what I'm doing in this scene based on what I know happens in the rest of the script. I want that scene to live on its own the way it, it should as, you know, as it does in my world as the character. Mm -hmm. Unless there's something in that scene that's totally relatable to something else and I have to know about that, uh, I won't read that other thing. Plus the fact that nobody, we're talking about the business before, nobody sends you a script anymore. Mm -hmm. They send you bites. <laughs> Just yeah. bites of you gotta, it. You've got to use your own ink, your own paper. You know, it's like, wow, you know. What so, do you do? What do you do with, for, for you? Like, what's your process when you get a bad script? So I, um, I go through the script and I just start reading it. And when anything comes to my head, I make notes in the margins. It doesn't have to mean anything. I just make the notes and I go back and look at it later. And I start to wonder why that came to me, uh, you know, that particular memory or that particular attitude or something or key word or whatever it is. Uh, and, and so that's the first thing. The second thing is if it's a big job, uh, I take the character and I sit down and I write my own character history, or at least I get it in my head about why this guy is who, how he is, you know? And uh, mm -hmm. so that helps me a lot of times, and it, which is good sometimes because you're on a set and you're doing something a certain way. The director says, why'd you do it that way? And I say, you really want to know? Because I'll give you the whole guy's, I'll give you the guy's whole history if you want to hear it, you know? Um, and so that's it. I, I, uh, I, I, I just make these notes and I keep going over it. And all of a sudden, I mean, just things, uh, so things from my life just come back to me that, that, that look like or feel like parts of the script. And sometimes they're written in the margin. Sometimes it's something in the margin that, that sparks that memory, you know? Uh, and then, uh, you know, I go, I go to, to, uh, memorization, uh, and, uh, and, and, get it inside the body and and I had I had one acting teacher for a short time she said you know what when you go into an audition or you step on a set just know that the work is done you've mm -hmm. done the work and and you and I know because we're disciplined we know that we've done the work mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a trust thing you trust that you've done it then you have to give it over to the director and when I coach people I coach I said listen you go into an audition you have three choices prepared and you have your ego intact because when somebody says i don't like number one number two but i like number three you mm -hmm. got it and you can do it because mm -hmm. you know i've had directors say to me sometimes i'm, I'm not sure what i'm doing i said listen to me i said i got no ego about this if you want to give me a line reading you give me a line reading because i think i'm doing what you want and i know you got to move on i know what your mm -hmm. job is and i know what my job is give me a line reading i don't care you know, and I'll give you back that line reading because I think I'm doing what you want. For you, like, obviously, you know, like, I mean, actors, I've had this conversation too, where actors get a script and it's, and again, they may not be feeling the script or feeling where, you know, especially when you know yourself and even the character, especially, you, as you said, being on a series regular for so many different shows. Yeah. A lot of times actors will just take the script, even though it's bad, and do it anyway. Yeah. And even when the performance comes out bad, they just, okay, well, whatever. But then yeah. there's other actors that, you know, that will vocally be like, this doesn't really make any fucking sense. So, right. like, are you, what's your like, approach to that? Do you, do you speak out or do you just be like, okay, I'm just going to take what's given to me and just not well, really say anything? Depends. It depends on the job. Like, okay. like you know, I mean, if, if you're a series regular or if you're coming back as a guest star, like on SWAT, like on the last episode that I did, there was a couple things. And the writer, Sarah, and the other guy that wrote it, um, they really trusted me and they respected me as much as I respected them. So I would call them over and I would say, listen, 
this you're saying this but but you've already said this in the last thing can we cut this out of here or can i say this here and mm -hmm. they'll say yeah that sounds better you know some writers are like that some are not some are so you know attached to their words they're like just do it do it that way you know and uh and and so you got you have to know the personalities that you're dealing with and again if it's a big job like on SWAT uh, or even this is us because the character is important, even though the job isn't as big character mm -hmm. is important. And I know the executive producer, Ken Olin um, from, you know, our days, he was a Botchko boy before I was, you know, so we sort of have a history together and I can approach him and say, Hey, Ken, th does this sound right to you? Because I, I, it sounds to me like this is what you mean. I, I what the writer means. And, uh, and so sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, you know, but you also have to have, and I hate to say it this way because it sounds a little egotistical, but when you have uh, a career like mine, somebody who's in the business this long, your writers might listen to you, might collaborate a little more with you than they will some kid with uh, so many followers on Instagram who's just mm -hmm. stepping on the set, you know. He's not going to know what writing is. And I've had the best writing in all of television, working for Botchko for four years. So I know what good writing is, you know. And I don't say that to people, but if they know my history, they know that, you know, I might have something to add to it. So the collaboration between the writer and, and the actor is really important. And some don't, uh, but you'll find that the best writers do. And, and, and I find this, you may find this too, when you do, when you do something. I find that that even if I if I say a line that they've written that I don't like, mm -hmm. and I say it in a different way that it works for me, they love it because they didn't hear it that way. They heard it a different way. Or they want it the way they heard it, you know? It's very Well, that's very what I loved about that's what I loved about Mumford, because he always had this way even when he didn't say much, yeah. He he had a sarcastic point to everything he said. Like there was yeah. always a certain, and what, I, and this is the thing, what I've loved about watching your career where it doesn't necessarily happen with actors in the business. And I think this is why, you know, I love that, you know, and, and again, for you, it's, it's amazing because I'm sure you get the question from people or hear it from people, even throughout your career, you know, you're so lucky to have a career as an actor. I always wanted to be an actor, you know, but I don't know how. And where for you, like, you, as you said, you didn't have the blueprint formal training. You just right. jumped into it. And most people yeah. don't necessarily, and I've always told people, I'm like, my, like my mentor, Sidney Pollack, he uh. taught me was like, actors don't act. They feel. They feel a yeah. scene. They feel a situation. And when you want to be an authentic actor, be yourself. Like, yeah. you could get the script and read the line and be like, my yeah. name is John. Yeah. I am going to the store. Yeah. You wouldn't talk like that. No. Or you could be like, my name is John. I'm going to the store. I'm, my name yeah. is John. I'm going to the store. Yeah. My name is John. I'm going to the store tomorrow. And you, and you pick up that metronome, per se, of, uh, in your head. And, you know, a friend of mine used to say to me, you know, when you're on a set, it's, it's similar like a football field. It's similar yeah. like an athlete where, you know, but it's also like a symphony. You've yeah. got your, you know, your, your, your guitar and you've got your bass and you've got, you know, your drum, which is the, the beat that holds everything together, which is your lead yeah. actor. Yeah. And you got to know your placements of where you belong. But the yep. thing what I like about you is where you came from this New York background with no prior training, which I've always said to people like, yes, training is, is key if you want to make sure that you don't stay stale yeah. or you have to be able to pay attention to look at the other actors that you're working with, right? be inspired by their performances to push your performance to be better and yeah. find your own mark and your own creativity. But for you, what I've loved 
is the fact that out of all the 30 plus year career compared to other actors who are formally trained, I have never seen you in a project where I've looked at a role that you've played and I'm going, mm, I'm still feeling the same type of style right. that he played in the previous project or the project before that. What yeah, has been the, your approach and how have you been able without having any formal training when you started to be able to not box yourself into the stereotype of being typecasted? I, I, I feel like being, first of all, not having a lot of training or hardly any training is good on one level because when you're a highly trained actor, it's not a bad thing. Training, to me, first of all, training is something that you need if the character and the script doesn't work for you. That's, that's when you need training, you know? Um, and, and in my career, it's always worked for me, you know? Uh, I, I think that... I, I, I'm, the question was about what was... Uh, what was your process in the sense of not okay. being typecasted? So, and never playing the same way twice or three times. I mean, I've, as I said, I've watched a yes. lot of shit that you've been done in the year. And I'm like, this guy brings something new to the table every time. And you don't necessarily find that, not only just in the business, but with actors that, as I said, that have that New York mobster swagger to them. Right. And as I said, being a guy that's, you know, buff and strong, but I've right. never even like, it's almost like, yeah, this guy's jacked like a motherfucker, but I don't even like put that into other than SWAT. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't look at your character every time you play and go, okay, well, this is the big muscly guy. It's going to, it's, it's, yeah. it's a guy that just is an actor that yeah. plays different things. I, so I, like, what's your approach? I think my approach comes from something that we talked about way in the beginning Okay. And that is, and that is, because I didn't pursue acting from a young age, I have amassed a lot of life experience. I've met a lot of different people. And every time I look at a script, I find somebody different from my past mm -hmm. that informs that, that character. And so it's just, I just wrote to, I just wrote a text to my old girlfriend, uh, who worked at McCall's, uh, uh, the other day and something reminded me of her and she goes, do you ever forget anything? <laughs> she goes, Oh my God. I, I said, no, I said, you know what? And now as an older person, I realize that maybe uh, something I didn't have any idea of then I, that maybe I was cut out to be this because I have this catalog of emotions and experience in my head that I go back to all the time, the greatest successes and the greatest failures, they're all there and clear as day. And, and, uh, and so, so and that's where I go when I read a script and I think, well, shit, this happened in my life or this, you know, this happened to my uncle or this, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I remember the emotion. I remember the culture around it, you know, and, and, uh, and, and so that's really my process is, is relating my life experience through these characters, um, you know, to to the camera and to, to and, and on film. And because, again, I, you know, I wasn't, you know, uh, waiting tables or anything like that. I did all these different things in my life. You know, um, I got a lot of experience there, a lot, a lot of things in that catalog, you know. Well, what, what, what advice then would you give, for example, for someone who... Again, let's just say, because again, people always use, yeah. you know, I, I, I don't have the money or, you know, um, they have yeah. self dealt within themselves and, you know, you took it, I mean, again, took a chance on yourself and yes, obviously your situation and yeah. how you started was different, but like for someone that was to start and have no formal training, but sees your career and wants to get into the business what advice would you give them one in in 
in becoming an actor. Right. And two, longevity. And three, what to expect. Because as you know, before you even came to L.A., right. you know, there, there, there's a, a glamorization in our business when you're yeah. not in the business. Like, people yeah. see the money, the cars, the fame, yeah, yeah, et cetera, sure. et cetera. And I'm sure even for you, you've had this conversation in the past. Like, when you, right. you book your first job, yeah. people are like, oh, you're rich now. <laughs> like, like, you're rich. You got, you're on TV. And they don't get the fact of, like, no. agents' fees, union fees, yeah. Uh, yeah. branding fees, marketing yeah. fees, yeah. all yeah. these fees that come, and just living expenses. And, yeah. and, and when you're done, you know, after that, you know, 12-hour, 13-day, and you get that residual check for, like, a couple cents of the dollar, you're like, okay, like, people don't get, like, this is – what it's like like you've got to be booking yeah. steady 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 oh, yeah, steady yeah. to actually make a a living yeah. in this business so what yeah. advice well, you would know. you give for somebody first of all a, a, a couple of those questions cannot be reduced to advice uh, one thing i would say to somebody who wants to be an actor mm -hmm. or even or even wants to be successful in life if you're going to spend any money on training Go into improvisation because improvisation is the heightening and exploring of every moment in the positive. And if you ever don't become an actor, that is a great, great talent to carry through life with you. Mm -hmm. uh, to always be able to take what you're given and turn it into something better, add something to it. Always never say no. Always say yes and add something. Yes. And, you know, and so on that to me, was the biggest gift that I ever had was my improvisational training, which just came from working out with that group and doing shows, you know, and doing the old spolin exercises and things like that. But that was, for me, anybody who wants to start out in acting should start out in improvisation because it not only gives you that positive outlook on life, but it, uh, 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 it, it teaches you um, that, let's say you get a job as an actor that, you, you you don't worry about forgetting, <coughs> forgetting a line. Mm -hmm. you, you can improvise your way back to where you are. You you know it's it's. Uh, um, but I, I for instance, when I first started doing these improv shows and, and taking this little training with with these people that were in the group, I was still in the ad business, and I sent about four or five people to my friend who was teaching the improvisation class. I said, you guys got to take this. It's really good for the business. It's like good for sales and whatever it is. They all took it. One is the CEO of a company now. One is a head of one of the heads of Telemundo. One is, I mean, they all rose to, and they all attribute to the, the rise in their careers to having taken this improv class because it teaches you one other thing that is most important for an actor. It teaches you how to listen. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and that to me, so, so, so to answer the question about what do you do to start acting, that would be the first step for anybody that I would say is to, is to learn to improvise and become, you know, take an improvisation class. The other stuff is advice that it, it's, 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 it's too hard to give broad advice to anybody about where their career is going to go, except, you know what, always believe in yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, and don't have expectations. Just know that if you put good out there, good will come back to you. You know, I lost the job. I, I, I was blackballed from CBS for 26 years. SWAT was my first regular role on CBS because somebody at CBS who was with another company 26 years before, I didn't do a series that they wanted me to do because it was out of town and my kids were four and two. And I said, no, I'm not going out of town uh, to Portland, Oregon, you know, to do a show. Mm -hmm. my, kids, my kids are four and two. And that person, because, and that person is famous in the business for doing this to people um, because I didn't do what he, she wanted um, put out the word uh, that I was not to do a lead in the CBS series. So that's the thing, and I, I, I mean, I've I've known many people, especially I mean, I've worked with C CBS and different shows, and I and I and I, it seems to be a, 
a recurring theme of people who have been a part of that network, you yeah. know, that have been able to do. And, and, I, and that's where I, I want to ask you, like, you know, we, we've seen so many crazy things where, you know, you're talking about Bill Cosby and, yeah. and, and, and we've, we've, we've gone through the Harvey Weinstein era of yeah. nonsense. You know, why do you feel that, you know, have we given, has the business given too much power to people who, you know, or, 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 or because again, all these things that, that we know that goes on, yeah. that we see, we experience, yeah. but everyone sort of, you know, yeah. doesn't want to have a voice. I, I mean, I've been, always been different. I've always been the person that has the voice. I, yeah. I've turned down jobs. I've walked away from jobs yeah. because I, because for me, it's like when this, when this, when you're done in this business, yeah. all you have is your soul and your pride yeah. and your heart intact because yeah. when, when the lights are on, yeah. you know, and people are seeing you on SWAT and they're seeing you on, this is us. And they're seeing yeah. you in Goodfellas. They're like, Oh, this is great. But as you know, 26 years you said being blackballed from CBS when the lights aren't on and the and the lights aren't on you yeah nobody gives a fuck yeah like like nobody like like you could book for example a show today and be on a show for 3 seasons be the top show in, on the net on the TV and then yeah. the show ends yep then what like yep. then what what what's What's your plan, next plan after that? And that's why, to me, like, I've always felt that the industry, even though people call it a dirty industry, yeah, it doesn't need to be because I look at the industry as that it's one big plate yeah. that we're all eating off of. But yeah. nobody really wants to share. And I think that's where you find where the, the industry, to me, gives too much power to these certain individuals yeah. to call the shots. And I think this is where, for me, my formula was where I've said, and maybe I want your opinion on this, is that like you coming from the marketing background, like myself, coming from a sales background, working in retail, like myself, that you have a different understanding of where okay, yeah. I can allow someone to call my shots right and be that but or I can make my own and that's yeah. why when 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 if you put your body of work compared to a guy that maybe has a bigger name than you his body of work ain't going to compare to yours because of the fact that you have been able to be your own man and do it your own way so well, like that's the thing that's the thing for me I I, I tell Young actors, this. I, um, I, I spoke at UCLA once, and I spoke. My son was at Chapman University. I, I spoke at their their theater department down there. I said, "You get into this business, you're going to make mistakes." I said, "But as long as those are mistakes from your honest heart, you can live with them. The first mm -hmm. time you make a decision or a mistake because you're trying to be politically correct, or you're trying to engineer a deal, or you're trying to do something." That will haunt you for the rest of your life. If you make an honest mistake, uh, uh, then you can live with that because you did the honest thing. You, you, you followed your honest heart. You know. Mm -hmm. The other thing I said at UCLA one time, and the teacher said to me, uh, I'll tell you what she said after. Um, I said to the students, I said, listen, I said, this business we know it's unlike all the other businesses in the world, but it's unlike the other businesses in the world in a very dangerous way. I said, all the other businesses in, in the world, especially the ones that I've been in, you learn something in each interaction that you take with you that educates you as to how to act in the next interaction. I said, mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what's different about this business. Every interaction is different. The people are different. The deals are different. I said, the only thing that you learn about is... You learn about yourself and how much shit you're willing to take to stay in this business. And the teacher said, can I put that in my syllabus? I said, yeah, go ahead. So like for you, you know? and that, it is the truth in a sense, number one. I mean, so like for you, like, you know, do you, a lot of times, as I said, like people don't really want to 
speak out because they're afraid of, you know, and even now we live in this era of, of, of cancel culture, yeah. you know, where you have to be politically correct with everything that you say and do. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it can, it can mean a decision of whether you work or you don't work at all. Do yeah. you feel that now, like for yourself, like, have you ever gone for a role that you wanted and you didn't get either based on the fact of political or social media aspect where that person maybe has not a good actor, not great actor, not better than you. You knew they were not, they were, you know, they, you, they, they weren't better than you, but they got the role because of their social media status. Um, that hasn't happened too much to me now because I'm, I'm older and people know me. But there definitely has always been throughout my career roles that I've gone for and really wanted and haven't gotten. Now, one of the things that I fall prey to, and I accept it uh, because I understand it, um, and I honestly don't get, I honestly don't get pissed off about it. But with the increase in diversity casting, there have been times when my agents and managers will call me about a role where the guy has an Italian surname, you know? Mm -hmm. And they're interested in me for it, you know, and they're courting me on it. And then I don't hear from them again. And I call my agents back and say, what happened to that thing? And they, they said, well, they went diversity casting. I said, oh, okay, you know, that's fine. But I'm finding that to be more more frequent for me now. Um, not necessarily social media, but more diversity, especially when you get on my age and you're going to play older cops or older lawyers or anything else that, you know, it's 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 important to see diversity in those older roles because it speaks to the history. Then it says that this person was a, a, a go-getter early on and now they're my age and they're a top lawyer or they're my age and they're a chief of police and, you know, and all that stuff. So, so historically it makes sense too, but I wanted the role just as bad as anybody else did, you know? Uh, and, and I don't, I don't get, I honestly, diversity is the only thing I don't get pissed off. But the only thing that pisses me off, Mm -hmm. The only thing that pisses me off is when I can't get in a room. If you if you hire somebody and you don't let me in a room and see what I got, that's the only thing in this business that pisses me off. You see me. Just see me, you know? And you don't want me after you see me? I totally get it. But see how, me, you know? how was the adjustment for you, obviously, with, with the COVID now situation? Like, did you find it? Because you said, you, you know, you stayed busy working throughout COVID. How yeah. was that adjustment for you now, like with the mask and the protocols and everything else? It was, uh, um, it was interesting. I mean, it was, it was, it, it tended to disconnect you from the scene at times and things like that. So I didn't really have, except for 